Thank you so much to the provost. Um, yes, I am in fact a triple jumbo, so it's nice to me among a friendly audience here. And although my training at Tufts was actually in psychology, and developmental psychology in particular, and human development, uh, my time at Tufts has always been kind of infused with animals on a personal level. Um, I was actually part of the Tufts equestrian team. I even married someone from the Tufts equestrian team, although he was an engineer, so we kind of balance each other out a little bit. Uh, <laughs> But all kidding aside, really the reason that I'm here today is because of my identity as a jumbo. I don't think that there's any other university where I could be doing the type of scholarship that I'm doing. Because right about now, you might be thinking to yourself, now what exactly is a developmental psychologist doing working at a veterinary school? That seems a little odd, doesn't it? And really my answer for that is only at Tufts. Um, but that's what I'm here to talk to you about today is my research and my research is really part of a larger team who's working across all the schools in the field of human-animal interaction. And human-animal interaction is this really fun field to be a part of because it's still in its infancy. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence about our relationships with animals, but the science is really growing and it's starting to gain traction in the scholarly community and that's what's really so exciting. But before we really get into all of that, I'm going to tug on your heartstrings for a moment, if you'll indulge me. So <laughs> if you could do me a favor, those of you who have a pet, please raise your hand. Good, right, so that's about right. Um, about 70% of households in the United States have at least one animal, and that number has been growing pretty steadily over the last 20 years. Now, how about those of you who had a pet as a child? How many of you had a pet as a child? Yeah, that's about right too. So it turns out that a lot of our formative experiences with animals happen in childhood. And that can really shape how we view animals and our relationships with animals more broadly kind of evolves over time. Now take a moment in your mind and go back and think about that childhood pet of yours. What kind of feelings come up for you when you think about that animal? If you're like most people, you probably have a fairly emotional reaction to thinking about your childhood pet. Um, and that's what we're finding in some of our research, is that this emotional connection that we have with animals is really powerful. One of my favorite research studies found that people were more likely to turn to their dog in times of emotional distress than anyone other than their romantic partner. So that means your mom, your sister, your best friend, your friendly coworker. No, you're more likely to go to your dog as a sense of emotional support. So that's pretty powerful, right? And some of my research, I've looked at pets in military families. Now what we found is that for kids who have a currently deployed parent, they're experiencing a significantly higher amount of stress, as you might imagine. But for those kids, if they have a strong emotional relationship with an animal, they actually do better in coping with that stress. So it may be that interacting with animals can be a kind of buffer um, against stress or protecting against stress. Now animals help us not only emotionally but also socially. In some of our research with teenagers, we found that teenagers who are more connected with animals are also more connected with their peers and family. So there's this idea of animals as a social facilitator, that they help us develop relationships around a shared interest, um, that we learn how to relate to other people in part by relating to other animals. There's some work that suggested that development of empathy towards other people can actually be linked to the development of empathy towards animals. So it really is broader than just our individual dyadic relationships with animals. And we see that in terms of connecting to one's community as well. In some research that we did with young adults, we found that those who were connected to an animal, had a strong relationship to an animal, were actually more likely to be contributing to their communities, to be active citizens. Now that's really interesting, right? Why might that be the case? Could it be that young adults sort of are finding a way to think outside themselves, to connect with others in their community? 
to think about goals that are broader than their own personal um, needs and desires. And so that's an area of research that we're looking to explore further. We've also had some great success integrating animals into educational curriculum. Animals are a great hook for kids to learn just about anything. Uh, one of our favorite programs that we do, we bring dogs into local schools and li libraries and kids read to the dogs. And for, <laughs> they listen very carefully, I promise. They never fall asleep. <laughs> And for kids who struggle reading, having a non-judgmental listener is a really powerful thing. And it can change their attitudes about reading and about being motivated to practice reading. So that's been really fun. We've also been working with uh, some of our, folk, our friends at the engineering department and integrating animals into science and engineering curriculum. So, for example, when we have some kids build a mobility assistance device for a disabled dog, they're learning some really great science and engineering principles, but it's embedded within this real life problem that's very engaging for them. And they can really get on board with solving it because animals are so intrinsically appealing for them. So there's some really interesting educational applications, and what we're hoping to do is learn more about evaluating the mechanisms behind those principles. So that all sounds pretty great, right? But maybe a little obvious, like of course animals are great, that sounds great, everyone looks like they're probably on board. So why do we need to be studying this? Why is the science important? And really it's because this is an emerging field, and we don't have a lot of good scientific data yet. Because it's so multidisciplinary, some of the research that exists is a little bit scattershot across a lot of different fields. And there hasn't yet been real cohesion in the field to determine effective programs, effective practices, even understanding why we interact with animals in different ways. There are so many different layers of nuance to human-animal relationships, just like human-human relationships. Even thinking about a teenager, her relationship with a dog may be completely different than the relationship she has with a cow she's raising for a 4-H project, which may be completely different from the relationship she has with an animal that she sees in the classroom. So there are many layers of ways in which we interact with animals, and figuring out how to measure those relationships is a challenge. Because our ultimate goal is to generate empirical data that can actually be used to make evidence-based recommendations. Moving beyond this anecdotal, anecdotal data, figuring out what are the mechanisms behind these relationships and how can we best measure them in a way that really gets at the complexity of the relationships. And the reason that this is important is because ultimately we'd like to shape public policy and practice using an evidence-based approach. If we see that animals are positive for kids and military families, then we can make recommendations about getting more resources to those families for having pets and keeping them as they move across state lines and as parents get deployed. Animal-assisted therapy is becoming a huge area of interest, which is great, but we need to know more about what does evidence-based practice look like in animal-assisted therapy? What is the best way to do it? What outcomes are we measuring? And that's really what we're trying to do. And that doesn't just mean dogs. We also have an ongoing research project right now um, that's testing the effectiveness of equine-assisted therapy. So there are a lot of different ways that we're aiming to go, but all with the ultimate goal of creating data-driven approaches to understanding these relationships that then impact policy and practice in a meaningful way. So why are we doing this at Tufts? I said being a jumbo is an important part of my scholarly identity. And it's really for two reasons. First, we have a great set of expertise here at this university. As you all know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But we have folks from veterinary medicine, human medicine, psychology, engineering, education, all wanting to work together to help develop this scientific framework for understanding human-animal relationships. And then the other reason is the students. We have students who 
are going on to be healthcare professionals, both veterinary and human medicine, educators, scientists, and they sort of intrinsically feel how it is that animals are part of what makes us human, but they want to understand more about that science. And so it's a really great opportunity for us to engage with the students in a number of different research, education, and active citizenship opportunities um, to sort of help facilitate their experiences as at Tufts, as well as being a part of engaging in an innovative area of scholarship. So I know that was a really broad overview, but I'd like to um, save some time for questions, so I will stop it right there. Thank you.